Well, I want to uh, add my welcome to those that will be viewing this on YouTube to, to the congregation. We have, uh, we have space for you in the congregation if you feel comfortable to come, but we're glad that you're where you're at and able to take part in uh, what we're doing here at Lake Moore United Methodist Church. So I do welcome those of you that are, are watching through the means of YouTube this morning in addition to those that are present. I want to take you in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. I know I've been in Mark mostly uh, through this time of this Knowing Jesus series, but I'm going to venture into Matthew today, chapter 11. And I'm going to begin at verse 2 and just read a few verses. This event that's described here is that which takes place between John the Baptist's disciples and Jesus. Did you know that John the Baptist had disciples? You may know that, may not know that. In those days, many rabbis and other religious leaders had those that kind of followed close at hand, sometimes attending to their needs, other times uh, certainly listening for instruction and following them. And uh, I don't know that John the Baptist intended to have disciples, but he did. And, and so um, we pick up at Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 2. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man, the person, who does not fall away on account of me. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, this word today. Pray that the words of my mouth and the intention of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. For asking Jesus' name, amen. Well, I chose uh, that, that hymn that we just sang, especially for one of the early verses, uh, one of the, the verses within it, verse 4. I want to just kind of repeat that verse and clue you into my sermon with it. Teach me to feel that you're always nigh. Teach me the struggles of the soul to bear. To check the rising doubt the rebel sign. Teach me the patience of an unanswered prayer. Okay, Emory, we'll go, we'll go to my slides if you, if you would. I want to share a, a little story of sorts, a parable of sorts by a man named Stanley Key. And he writes this. Two rather frightful fellows knocked at my door this morning and asked permission to enter. Their faces seemed familiar, but I was uncertain of their identity. What are your names, I asked. Neither seemed ready to reply, though their appearance startled me. Though their appearance startled me, something inside me wanted to let them in. Wavering, I questioned them again. What do you want here? What are your intentions? And slowly and with a tactfulness that made me a bit uneasy, the big one replied, We intend no harm. We only want to visit a bit. And then, with a wink to his companion, he added, We won't stay long. They stepped inside the door. But what are your names? I demanded again. Obviously feeling more confident now that they had gained entrance and sensing my confusion and hesitancy, the big one answered, My name is Discouragement. And I am Doubt. The smaller companion seemed suddenly to have grown much larger. We've been sent. 
my capacity to reason clearly began to fade. These two fellows, ugly as they were, seemed indeed to have a right to come in. Life had been hard lately. The ministry difficult. Part of me wanted to put an end to this inner struggle and simply be done with it. But a voice within me also clamored to be heard. They don't belong here, it said firmly. They will do you and those around you great harm if you permit them to stay. I was still vacillating as I passively watched the visitors settle into my living room. The voice spoke again, this time with a sternness that struck fear into my soul. If they stay, I must go. From somewhere, confidence, strength, clarity suddenly returned to me. You must leave now, I said to my visitors. The firmness and assurance in my own voice surprised me but bolstered my courage. You are not welcome here. I have another guest already living here. It would be impossible to lodge you both at the same time. The mention of the other guests seemed sufficient to motivate both discouragement and doubt to leave rather quickly. However, while departing, one of them turned and said with a wicked laugh, We'll call again, perhaps tomorrow. Discouragement and doubt. We've seen uh, from some of the earlier sermons that I gave in this series, knowing Jesus, how Peter said, I want to know Christ. And then I took you to Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering. And then we went to, to Jesus Himself to see the things that matter to Jesus, to try to get to know Him directly by the things that He did, the things that He chose to do very purposefully, things like time alone with His Father in prayer, the preaching and the seeing people come to a relationship with Himself. Uh, last time that we were together, I took you in a little different way to Jesus and the things that seemed to trouble Him. Things that brought about some anger and, and also some sorrow in His heart. Well, today we're going to try a little different approach. We're going to use this, uh, this encounter that I read for, for you just a, a moment ago. We're going to use it as a means to kind of look at how how there are things that happen in the life of a believer and how Jesus really is the remedy for that. And, and, and in turning to Him, come to know Him better even through such things as doubt. There are times when the experiences of the Bible, the, the record of the Bible may surprise us. I don't know if there was any bit of surprise as you heard me read this little, this little uh, episode this, this morning. Emory, bring up that first slide of uh, John the Baptist, if you would. I think that we all have experienced doubt in the Christian faith, but we might not expect John the Baptist to have any. The man was remarkable in, in most every way that I can think of. Such an outstanding figure. He came onto a scene when they had not had a prophet for, for hundreds of years in the land and they saw him as a true man of God. He was like no other of his day. His birth was spectacular. His life is one of amazing discipline, commitment, faith, courage. He was, um, as I say, born uh, with a unique announcement to his father that he would be a Nazarite from birth. That meant that he would never eat any of the fruit of the vine, nor drink of the vine. No alcohol was to be a part of his life at any point. It also said about, the angel said about him that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And then some of you remember how, how there was that encounter between Elizabeth, his mother, who was carrying him at the time, 
And Mary, who was now with child, uh, conceived of the Holy Spirit. And when the two women have this encounter, Elizabeth says, the, the, the baby in my, in my womb just leapt for, for joy at your presence. And, and especially the presence of the one whom you carry. So we get the sense that John the Baptist even had the Holy Spirit while, while he was forming in his mother's womb. Well, uh, there's more about him that is spectacular. Of course, he, he lived in the desert. He ate locusts and wild honey. He wore camel hair clothes. He was of a fiery disposition. He confronted sin and called for repentance. He certainly recognized Jesus as the Messiah, saying to his disciples at one point, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I heard a wonderful sermon one time and it stuck with me. You know, some sermons stick with you, many of them don't. But I remember hearing a sermon on the passage where John announces the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the scripture says that his disciples left him and went to follow Jesus at that point. And the sermon was all about the kind of a man who could allow his disciples to go freely to another. The kind of humble man that he was. There was a point later where um, people come to John and they say, you know that one that you baptized? The people are now coming to him instead of you. And John said, he must become greater and I must become lesser. I mean, he's a remarkable man. A man of faith. A man of great confidence in God. And so we don't really expect him to be the one who's, who now has what seems to be some real doubt. But he is. We read again, uh, verse 2, where it says, When John heard in prison... He's in prison. What Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist did not seem to have any earlier doubts. Spirit of God continuing to confirm that, that this was the Christ, but now in prison, there's a question that seems to rise in his mind. We're going to look into the, some of the whys and doubts in John and in believers, in us, in just a moment. Uh, I hope the sermon is largely one that's focused on the practicalities of, of uh, facing doubts and overcoming. But before that, I want to say two things, just really kind of, kind of quick. These aren't my main points, but these are, are, are points that I like to, like to say. First, first, let me say this, that, that doubt... Doubt does come to the person of faith. Doubt at least knocks at the door. How much time doubt has in your life is kind of up to you, but it knocks at the door, I, I guarantee it, in the, in, in the person of faith, in, in the Christian's life. In fact, in the New Testament, virtually every time that it speaks about doubt, except for maybe one, it's addressing the Christian, not the not the person who is not yet of faith, but the one who has faith. And we know in the life of Jesus, even with his own disciples, he was often saying to them, are you still, do you still have such a little faith? Do you still doubt? And calling them to something more, to something, to, to something that is stronger and firmer, faith, faith in him. Doubt does come to the person of faith. And it, it seems to have come into the life of John the Baptist. I want you to note that Jesus does not respond harshly to, to the inquiry made through John's disciples. But rather, he gives them an answer to take to John that, that should encourage and help him in his faith. Doubt does come to the person of faith. If it came to John the Baptist, maybe we can be encouraged if we're experiencing some of it today, that it, it, it will come to us too. It does not mean that we have left the faith or 
are denying the faith, but questions can come. Second thing I want to say uh, pretty quickly is that I appreciate that John takes his doubts to Jesus. Now, he can't go himself directly because he's in prison, but he can send the, the, the next best thing, his, his own disciples, to, to go and make inquiry. And he, and he goes right to Jesus. They do. They do. They go right to Jesus to uh, confirm, to assure him in the faith, uh, to, to know that he has, he has announced the right Messiah. That must have meant something to him. I'm sure it did. He knew that to be his calling, to make way for the Messiah. John inquires of Jesus. He takes his doubts to Jesus. We're wise when we go directly to God with our doubts. Pray. Seek the Lord and His answers to our questions and concerns. Come with honesty and with faith, even as we raise honest questions. In the Bible, every time I see someone raise an honest question with Jesus, He answers it. He does not make fun of, He does not cast away those who come with honest answers. So, so I want to say these, these two points. Doubts do come to the person of faith, but when they come, let's, let's take them to Jesus. Okay. Having said those two things up front, um, I believe that the doubts that came to John the Baptist may, may be quite similar to the doubts that come in our lives. There might be the same sorts of reasons that we might have doubts that, um, that we can look at together today. And so I want to do that with you. I hope this can be a very practical kind of sermon for you. So here's three things. First, doubts often come as we are experiencing difficult circumstances. Doubts often come when we're experiencing difficult circumstances. John the Baptist was in the most difficult place. Uh, in prison. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, you know, as, as believers, um, if we live long enough, and if we... If we live what, what really is a, you know, just a real, real life, we're going to face some things that shake us. We're going to face difficult things in, in small measure, but also sometimes in great measure. Uh, I remember uh, very early on in the, in the ministry, uh, there was a young man in the congregation that I was serving. Uh, he was about 17, I think, at the time that they discovered that something was uh, dramatically wrong with Tony and his blood. And they began a process of trying to figure out what was, what was going on with him. They, they tested his bone marrow. They did all kinds of things. Uh, they tried to uh, uh, figure out a way that they could keep him healthy and maybe uh, get him into remission. But uh, though there was some advancement uh, in, in, a, in a good way, there, there also came the regression and ultimately his death. And that was a, a difficult time for us as a church. We've been praying for Tony repeatedly. Obviously, uh, it was a difficult time for his family. It was especially difficult for his mother. And I can remember being with, uh, with his mom and she being just, just in... The intensity of grief that sometimes comes when, when a mother loses a child. And uh, she had faith, but she was just overcome with the grief. And said, you know, Tony's in the whole world. And I, I think uh, what she was saying is what many of us have faced. You know, when, when there's a difficult thing, that's a consuming thing. And when a difficult thing revolves around a person we love, it's a consuming thing. So difficult things happen to us, and, 
And I imagine that each of you can relate. That there has been something in your life probably that, that, that just kind of puts you in that place where you didn't want to, but you almost felt like you couldn't help but say, God, are you with me? Do you, do you care for me? Is there good somehow to come in this? I just, I just can't get a hold of it. Um, doubts are especially real in difficult circumstances. John the Baptist has been faithful to God, but it's led to a lengthy imprisonment. Some believe that he was probably at this point imprisoned in a dungeon for around a year in length. He's been a year in a prison, in a dungeon prison. William Barclay once wrote, For any man this would be a terrible fate, but for John the Baptist it was worse than for most. He was a child of the desert. All his life he had lived in the wide open spaces with the clean wind on his face and the spacious vault of the sky for his roof. Now he was confined within four narrow walls of an underground dungeon. For a man like John, who had perhaps never lived in a house, this must have been agony. Most Christians will face some challenge that will test faith and maybe even the goodness of God or God's compassion. Although uh, Jesus does not give to John a remedy for his condition, he does respond to the question raised by John's disciples. Uh, he responds not just with words, I am the Christ or I am the Messiah. Instead, he points the disciples to tangible acts that are the, the criteria of the Messiah as given by Isaiah's prophecy. Some believe that Jesus may have literally done the, the very things that, that he speaks of and is recorded here in Matthew in front of John's disciples so that they can go back. He says, tell John what you see and hear. And perhaps Jesus at that point healed the one that was blind and brought back sight. Took a lame man and made him walk. Brought hearing to the deaf and uh, freed someone from leprosy. Could he have raised the dead in their presence? It's possible. We know he did with Lazarus and with a few others. And Jesus preached the good news to the poor. This, this was the word that he gave to John's disciples to take back, which should have given to John some confidence. No, he wasn't relieved from his imprisonment. But all these things spoke of Jesus' caring for the hurting, for the needy. Sometimes it helps us, even though our needs are not changed, to see how God is helping another. How God is kind to someone else in need. And I believe that John was no doubt helped. He was in the midst of a difficult circumstance, but, but he went to Jesus through, the, through his disciples. Uh, God may not give us the answer, but he will respond to us. He will respond to us in, in ways that may help our doubts. May we go to him. May we go to him. May we cry out to him, even as Job did. Let's be honest and real in our prayers to God. Cry out to God as His needy children. Doubts often come in difficult circumstances. We know it. You might be in some today. It's the second thing. Doubts may come when expectations don't meet with our experience. Doubts may come when our expectation of the Christian life doesn't meet with our experience of it. 
I have, I have a, a feeling that many Christians today don't have any perspective that the Christian life may be a difficult life. Dallas Willard, who some of you may know his name, once wrote that Western Christians and American Christians often have no concept of discipleship. No concept of a difficult journey with Christ. No concept of what it might require of us to live the life of faith. I came across a little, uh, a little thing that was written on the Lord's Prayer, or what some of you might call the Disciples' Prayer, you know, Our Father who art in heaven. And I think it, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very helpful for us to think of a different concept of Christianity than what we might. See if you can follow with me as I go through the, the, the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. I cannot say are if I live only for myself. I cannot say father if I do not endeavor each day to act like his child. I cannot say who art in heaven if I am laying up no treasure there. I cannot say hallowed be thy name if I am not striving for holiness. I cannot say thy kingdom come if I am not doing all in my power to hasten that event. I cannot say thy will be done if I am disobedient to his word. I cannot say in earth as it is in heaven if I don't serve him here in the here and now. I cannot say give us this day our daily bread if I am dishonest or seeking things in subterfuge. I cannot say forgive us our debts if I harbor a grudge against anyone. I cannot say lead us not into temptation if I deliberately place, place myself in its path. I cannot say deliver us from evil if I do not put on the whole armor of God. I cannot say thine is the kingdom if I do not give the king the loyalty due him from a faithful subject. I cannot attribute to him the power if I fear what men may do. I cannot ascribe to him the glory if I seek honor only for myself. I cannot say forever if the horizon of my life is bounded completely by time. Well, I share that with you because I think sometimes our, our assumptions of Christianity, our, our expectations of Christianity are so much different from what really God has intended for us. And we do well to open our minds and hearts to, to a broader understanding. We may expect certain things of God. John the Baptist expected Jesus to have a different sort of ministry, I think. Remember how John said, I baptize you with water, but one who comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I think that uh, John the Baptist probably expected Jesus to have a little of that fiery <laughs> disposition to him to, to root out the enemy, to overcome the oppressor, to bring in the rule of Christ upon the earth. All those things that were promised of the Messiah, John expected, and he wasn't wrong, he just had the wrong timing. And we know sometimes as we read those prophetic words about Christ, we can see how, how some of the people got kind of mixed up a little bit. Because right in the midst of the talk of the suffering servant, there is the reigning king. And they saw one coming, and we now are aware that Jesus had to suffer and die for sin before he comes again to reign and so some of the expectations that John had for him certainly were not, were not coming about. We're not coming about. I made reference to this already. What expectations do we have as Christians? Do we expect a life of comfort and free from trouble? <laughs> Wasn't it Jesus who said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first? Didn't Jesus also say, 
I've told you these things so that you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Our hope as believers may be for an easy life, but God seems to have better things in mind for us that may only come through difficulty. We're trusting God as our only resource. John the Baptist was faithful in the work of God. Perhaps he expected that God would therefore protect and bless many missionaries and ministers have experienced very little fruitfulness in, in ministry and have wondered, God, I, I didn't think it was going to be this way. But it seems that God values uh, things a little differently than what we sometimes do. He values things like faithfulness and perseverance and trust. I think it's wise in these days to expect more persecution and trouble. Especially if we're vocal for the Lord or in the Lord's work. I'm not talking about being persecuted because we're mean-spirited or judgmental or getting someone's face. Rather, I think that just as we live a holy life, it's going to convict others. Let's, let's try to line up our expectations more closely with the Word of God and not some human manipulation of it. Why do we fall prey to doubts? First, doubt may come because we're facing difficult things. Second, we may doubt God because our expectations of the plan of God, God's call upon our life or our experience of trouble uh, may be mistaken. Here's a, here's a third and final one. We doubt because we have an incomplete knowledge of what God's doing. We doubt sometimes because we just don't know and understand what God's doing. John the Baptist had, at least in part, a popular conception of the Messiah. One rooted in the scripture, but overlooking the suffering servant aspect of the Messiah's work. John wasn't alone in thinking that when the Messiah came, there would be this rain coming. Remember how two of the disciples said, can we sit on your right and left when you come into your kingdom? Are you at this time going to restore Israel? And others were also in that, in that same boat. Remember those disciples on the road to Emmaus after the death of Christ? When the resurrection, resurrected Christ met them, and they were discouraged and downcast and he said, what's happened? And they told him. And then they said this, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They didn't realize that this must happen first. They didn't understand the full picture of the working of God. They had an incomplete knowledge. And we likely may as well in times of doubt. Could God be up to something greater a greater good than we can see. Are we, are we able, with God's help, to let eternity reshape our conception of the temporary life here on earth? What is truly most important for us here, God, we, we don't always see it. What can we do to help our doubts be replaced with faith in, in this regard of an incomplete knowledge. I, I, would, I would say it may not seem so, but Jesus directed John's disciples back to the Scripture through the deeds that he did so that John could line up the Scripture and the deeds and see that they were in sync. And I think when we have an incomplete understanding, we're, we're wise to go to the Scripture too. We may not find the absolute um, sp specific of the answer, but we'll, we'll find Christ in it. We'll find the nature of God in it. We'll find hope in it. We'll find help in it. I really want to encourage you to be regularly in the Bible. It is amazing how God can use a regular plan of Bible reading in your life. 
If you're reading in the Bible, and even in places that seem like they don't, don't even make sense how you're going to find a word from God in a place like Second Chronicles or, or, or some other spot that's a part of your daily Bible reading, I guarantee you God will give you something of Himself there. And you'll be amazed at the way that God will speak comfort to your heart, if nothing else. And something, something of the help that is in God. Doubts often rise in, in, our, in our lives because we don't fully know the mind of God. And He calls us back to the Scriptures as a way of helping us really to have confidence to go forward. Well, one, one final word I want to say. We don't know in an absolute way how John the Baptist responded when his disciples came back to him with the word of what they had seen and heard. But there may be a little bit of a clue a little bit later in, in Matthew's Gospel. We know that John the Baptist had confronted the sin of Herod and it had led to imprisonment. And, and most of you know that John the Baptist was later behead, beheaded. This, uh, this little verse shows up in Matthew 14. It says, John's disciples came after the beheading took his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. I don't know how you interpret this, but it, it may be an indication that John's faith was again buoyed up. And because he had confidence in Jesus, his disciples did as well, so much so that upon his death, they went first to tell Jesus, to tell Jesus of it. I don't think that if they had rejected Jesus, they would bother to tell him. So I, I believe that John's faith was restored even in the midst of his doubts. And I believe that his disciples also came because their faith in Christ was also buoyed up. Friends, uh, doubts are li likely to come in our life as believers. But doubt need not be the place where we park and live. So I say to you, run to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Ask your honest questions. Check your expectations. Search the scriptures for greater insights. And mostly cling to God with faith in our wonderful Savior. I saw this little, little saying that I thought was quite good and I'll end with it. We may not understand all His ways. We may not understand all His ways, but we can trust His heart. We can trust His heart. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank You that You give us even a place within the Scripture where there is a person of great faith and yet uh, an experience of doubt to give us encouragement in the midst of what we may be facing. But Lord, may doubt not be the last word. May, may we kick out doubt as we recognize your presence in us and for us. Lord, I thank you for the work that you want to do in us. A work that is always good. Lord, lead us into an even closer love and relationship with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the love of God, the tender mercy of Jesus Christ, the Savior, God the Son, and the comfort and help of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll see you next time. Thanks.